Good afternoon, and thank you very much for all of you being here. Uh, my name is Ivan Krastev, and I'm the permanent fellow here in the Institute for Human Sciences. And we're very happy to have you for this uh, talk, which we're organizing together with the Ministry of Defense of Austria. And we decided to have a series on the big picture, how the world is changing, the geopolitical dimension of the change. And we really decided to get with the people that not simply know that the world is changing, but they have an idea how it is changing. And the first talk in this series was uh, John Sawyers, uh, the former head of MI6, who was here uh, a month ago, less than a month ago. And now I'm, I'm really very happy to introduce to you our second speaker. It's going to be very easy to introduce him because uh, when somebody was a prime minister and minister of foreign affairs for a long time, you don't need to read his CV. And this is exactly what Ahmed uh, Devotogu was. Uh, but he also is the writer of a very important book, probably one of the most discussed books in uh, the last 10 years when it comes uh, to geopolitics and uh, how we are seeing the world today, called Strategic Depth. So how the world looks like from Turkey. I do believe that the changes that we are seeing are also very much based on how Turkey is changing mm -hmm. its foreign policy orientation. And the idea is basically to have a 30 minutes major talk coming from Professor Duvutogu. Then in 10, 15 minutes, I'll try to ask some questions. And then we are going to go for a 30 minutes with all of you. So you're going to have a possibility to ask your questions and basically be part of, uh, uh, of this discussion. Uh, as part of this series, we're going to have four other speakers, just for those of you who are interested. Uh, we are going to have uh, first the former Indian Minister for Foreign Affairs, Mr. Menam. And then we're going to have uh, the, somebody who was just till a month ago, uh, the Assistant Secretary for Europe in the Trump administration, was Mitchell. And then we're going to have Bill Burns, who was under Secretary of State during the previous administration. And many people expected him to become a Secretary of State if uh, Mrs. Clinton has won. Uh, and we're going to end up with uh, Sergei Karaganov, the head of uh, Council for Foreign and Defense Policy of the Russian Federation. So it's a really big name about the big picture. And this is great pleasure to give the floor uh, to Mr. Devotoglu. Thank you very much, Ivan, for this excellent and short introduction, uh, because I need more time to talk. Uh, it is great. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it is a great pleasure uh, back to be in Vienna, a historic city which I always admired. After I resigned from my position as prime minister, I published a book on cities and civilizations. I made special reference to certain cities as the center of uh, civilizations as well as political change. And there I uh, wrote that cities are our teachers. Our teachers are not just human beings. Cities are teaching us more than human beings, in fact. And whenever I came to Vienna, I always learned something new and right at the center of Europe and uh, where the history flowed throughout the centuries. And again, thanks for this very kind invitation uh, and for, to Vienna, uh, to Yuan and uh, to IWM, as also to Minister of Defense. Uh, today I want to um, uh, talk about the change in international dynamic, international order. Ivan mentioned my book, Strategic Depth, in Turkish, translated in more than 10 languages, except English, because I, there were several uh, proposals to translate, but I wanted to translate myself, which postponed all this transition, which was published in 1999, uh, 2001. Uh, so it was an analysis of post-Cold War era. Recently, I completed another book, which will be published soon uh, by Cambridge University Press on systemic earthquake and the struggle for world order. I will make a short summary of this book. Uh, but before, uh, first, uh, about the future of world order, I want to uh, discuss method a methodological issue, how to approach the question of international order or world order. 
Then I will make some reference to, to systemic earthquake. Why did I prefer earthquake as an analogy in uh, understanding international relations? Uh, first of all, uh, about the methodology. Uh, recently, a few months ago, I was in Kazakhstan in Astana Forum. During our discussion, a roundtable discussion, academicians, my former colleagues like President Tadic, uh, President, uh, Belgian uh, former Prime Minister, Cr President Karzai, and several other academicians. In two days' time when we discussed, after in my session, I made a summary and I said today, there are two extreme positions regarding the future of international order, especially in post-Cold War era. One is utopic optimism. The other one, the other extreme is nihilistic pessimism. Uh, when the Cold War has ended, the end of history theory uh, assumed that in the future there will be an era of peace and order based on liberal values and the history will end. This was one of the most utopic optimism uh, in methodology, uh, which was uh, pro I mean, proposing a future like a heaven on earth. Uh, at that time, I was a young academician. I criticized this approach, and I uh, wrote an article and published a book in 1994 criticizing Fukuyama's approach and said, the story will never stop because everything is changing. This is not an end of history. The history will be flowing, will be accelerated, and will flow much faster than before. Uh, because if technology is changing so fast, if there is a, a huge human mobility on Earth, you cannot imagine that there, is, there will be a statistical oriented order. There will be an order in a dynamic way. In early 1990s, there was a, uh, such an utopic, optimistic approach based on new world order concept. But now, in these days, wherever you go, uh, whoever talks, the future projection is very much negative. I call this nihilistic pessimism, especially in the last three, four years. This nihilistic pessimism is spreading everywhere. The scenarios of uh, third world war and asymmetric war there is no real attempt or vision for the future of world order. Both of these are not right approaches for me. And when I criticize both of these uh, approaches uh, in a methodological way, the mo med uh, moderator of the session, Nick Groney from BBC, he asked me, what is your proposal if you criticize both of these? I said my proposal is uh, realistic optimism. Because if you are in, in a nihilistic, pessimistic way, it is a vicious circle. Nihilistic pessimism will produce more pessimism and you will be trapped. But if you do not see the reality of the world, whatever it is, and if you try to ideologize the future of the hum uh, humanity, right, what happened, what was done by Fukuyama, you cannot understand the existing situation. Yes, we have many challenges. Yes, we have many chaotic situation. Yes, there is no any good, bad uh, success story in international affairs uh, as a peace effort. Yes, the economic rivalry, protectionism is increasing. Explosive populism is increasing. But at the end of the day, we are the ones who will produce an alternative for this chaotic situation. We cannot be self-fulfilling prophecy of pessimistic future, ap apocalyptic type of future. So what, how can we first, I will try to give you what is the real picture. Then I will make a proposal uh, in a short way, which I analyzed in my book, which will be appearing soon. About the world order, why I, uh, did I criticize uh, the end of history theory? Because this was egocentric illusion as Toynbee mentioned before, egocentric illusion of hegemonic powers. All hegemonic powers, when they became the leading power, they thought that they ended the history, like uh, Pax Romana or Ottoman, Pax Ottomana or uh, now Pax Americana. They all thought that they ended the history. 
But after the Cold War ended, until now, in the last 25, 30 years now, I, I, am, uh, I emphasize that there, are, there were four basic earthquakes. Earthquake is a good analogy because as Turks we lived in earthquakes, therefore it, it is good to project, imagine. Before the earthquake, you have to be ready for the earthquake. Earthquake or crisis is fact of life. And crisis is fact of international order. Everywhere, there will, every time, there will be some sort of crisis. It is important thing is you have to be ready for the crisis. If earthquake happens, then you, have, you, should not, you shouldn't be showing panic. You should try to respond properly in a rational way. And after earthquake, there will be aftershocks. You have to manage these aftershocks, then you have to restore the order. In international system, in the last 30s, we had four big earthquakes, worldwide earthquakes, which had aftershocks, still continuing. One is geopolitical earthquake in 1991, when Soviet Union and Warsaw Pact collapsed. Throughout Euro-Asia, a geopolitical shift had, did emerge, which was positive in one sense, but at the same time, which had a crisis in itself, uh, uh, seeds of crisis in itself. And this, the aftershocks of earthquakes were in Balkans, Caucasia, Black Sea, Central Asia, from Bosnian crisis to Kosovo, from Transnistria crisis to Abkhazia or Ossetia, and civil war in Kyrgyzstan and in Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan civil tension. So that earthquake, although it produced some positive results, had uh, uh, pro, uh, also resulted in several crisis points. And important is many of the aftershocks uh, of this geopolitical earthquake is still continuing today as a potential of tension. Like Georgia Russia war in 2008 because of Ossetia, like C Crimea tension or in Ukraine, uh, like Nagorno-Karabakh issue. I call this era not peace, but ceasefire, prolonging ceasefires. Ceasefire means not peace. Ceasefire is just ending violent uh, violence against each other, waiting for a future war or peace. And that the aftershocks of these earthquakes are still today valid after 25 years, many of them. Second biggest earthquake was security earthquake in 2001, which became 911. Uh, and the psychology of the world has shifted from democracy to security after 911. The priorities, preventive war, concept of preventive war, uh, was the opposite of 1990s psychology, which assumed to have a, a democratic transformation. And uh, American interventions in Iraq and Afghanistan created certain results. For example, this morning I was talking on EU-US relations. The 1990s was a success period of, for EU, but after 2001 security earthquake and Iraqi intervention, the uh, relation between US and EU in general has changed. Even George W. Bush at that time used the terminology old Europe, new Europe. Uh, like Cold War time, East and Central Europe, new Europe, the other is uh, old Europe. So the terminology has changed. The international law has been interpreted by every actor based on their security concerns. Russia, for Russia, it was for Chechnya, for China, it was the Xinjiang issue, for uh, uh, everybody, for every actor there was a terrorist for uh, the concept of insecurity because of this situation. Uh, the third biggest earthquake was an economic earthquake in 2008. This time, geopolitical and security shifts has been deteriorated within a global economic crisis. 
The second earthquake still have aftershocks. Today, neither in Iraq nor in Afghanistan have a stable, peaceful order. Still, there is a potential, especially in Afghanistan, also in Iraq. So it means security earthquake did not have any restoration for the future. The potential risks are still there. It has been accumulated. Global economic crisis was, has shaken the societies and different sector, uh, so societal sectors of the countries. It started a sectoral crisis uh, in mortgage sector and uh, then continued as an economic financial crisis, banking system, then economic crisis altogether, then finally through unemployment, especially in Europe, a political crisis. Uh, I remember uh, when I was Minister of Foreign Affairs, I had in my term of four years, uh, I saw five or six Greek ministers of foreign affairs because Greek governments were changing. Similarly, five, four or five ministers of even French foreign ministers changed very quickly because of these economic problems. There was a, a general political instability emerging in, Spain, in different European countries in general. And that the result of this earthquake is still continuing. Brexit could not be understood without understanding the impact of uh, global economic crisis. And the economic institutions in many places have been reshaped. We can discuss more on this issue. And the fourth crisis, biggest uh, big earthquake, was structural earthquake, what I call. After Arab Spring and Ukrainian crisis, many nation states had faced structural problems. The institutions of the states collapsed. The territorial control of the states did change. You will, you, today, in many countries, you don't know with whom you will be uh, co uh, coordinating or doing diplomacy because there are several authorities in the same country, like in Libya, in Syria, in Yemen, in Ukraine, uh, in practical sense. The internationally recognized authority and de facto authorities are there. So, and this structural earthquake is continuing. What is the result? The result is out of these four earthquakes, every earthquake became brought new accumulation of aftershocks. And we had a systemic earthquake in international order. Systemic earthquake means that not only one crisis or two crises together, but system itself, national systems, regional systems, and global system, UN system itself, is facing uh, big structural problems, what I call systemic earthquake. On national level, the, uh, we can define this as a the fragility of the countries, of the nation, of the national order. And on regional base, in many regions today, we have some sort of Cold War emerging, re-emerging, like in the Middle East, like in Gulf. And in global system, there is an absence of inclusivity. Now, what is the solution if we have such a systemic earthquake? We need to have new approaches to, to this dynamic situation, and there is a need for some new values to be respected. There, uh, based on this realistic uh, analysis of international crisis, I propose five basic principles for the restoration of the systems, uh, national, regional, global order for the future. The most important principle is inclusivity. Uh, inclusivity today and also throughout the history is the main uh, character of an order. Long surviving orders, when we look at, they are able to sustain and continue in the history if they are inclusive. 
Let me give you an example. Once after 9-11 uh, at Princeton University, uh, I gave a conference. At that time, there was a high emotions in American society, right the high emotions because of 9-11, first time ever America, who was supposed to be safe in the continent, was attacked by in, in the centers uh, of the country. Uh, because of these emotions, there was preparation when I was there. Afghanistan war started, and there was preparation for Iraq war. In my uh, lecture, I said, what US today, uh, what US needs today is not a new Caesar, but a Marcus Aurelius of Roman Empire. Caesar was the big conqueror to make Roman Empire bigger and influential. And during his time, city of Rome was basically Roman character. But once you conquer many places, you have to be ready in next stage of history, those conquered lands, human population would come to the capital. This is so natural historical phenomena. And I said, after all these migrations and new United States of America, now what you need is not to fight only, but to be more inclusive. And Marcus Aurelius is a stoic philosopher. I admire one of the leading historical figure in this sense. How to protect Roman order for him, not just fighting to Teutonic tribes, but trying to make Roman Empire more inclusive. And Mitraic temples, Jewish population in Rome, and all the others were facts of that. What is this lesson from Roman Empire? Even in Ottoman centuries as well, during the high centuries of Ottomans, Istanbul was uh, like a mini uh, uh, East Europe, mini uh, Anatolia, mini Mediterranean, mini Asia, etc. Because that is the character of the society in this type of situation. Uh, and what is the lesson from this Roman experience? Survival, establishing an order might base on military, but Sustainability of a political order bases always on inclusivity. Today, in national, regional, and global order, the main challenge is there is a rising exclusivist uh, populism. And, and in that speech, I made a future projection. I said, today, what US needs is not is a Marcus Aurelius, but a black Marcus Aurelius. The best restoration in US will be by a black president. At that time, President Obama was not in the picture. Later, when he visited Turkey, I was Minister of Foreign Affairs, just before, I, uh, after two months I became, uh, that uh, was in the newspapers. Even today, in Europe, I can understand the psychology uh, against refugees or the psychology against uh, non-Europeans uh, uh, or this. But if the British Empire was so uh, dominant in 19th century, like Caesar of Rome, after two centuries, London will be multicultural. This is unescapable from India, from Africa, from everywhere. If French controlled Africa, North Africa for two centuries, then Paris will be multicultural. This is, this is a fact of history. You cannot escape this fact. Or if you don't want to be in, okay, be like Iceland or some a country who do not contact with any other. This is same for us, although we are not big power. People were telling me why you are so much interested in Balkans, Caucasia, Central Asia, Middle East, I was uh, telling them once, uh, not because I, I have uh, uh, vacant time to deal like a hobby. No, because there are more Bosniaks in Bosnia than in, Bos uh, in Turkey than in Bosnia. We have more Albanian in Turkey than in Albania. We have more Kosovars in Turkey than in Kosovo. 
We have more Chechens in Turkey than in Chechnya. We have more Abkhazians in Turkey than in Abkhazia. We have, we have more Ossetians in Turkey than in Ossetia. We have more Georgians in Turkey than in Georgia. We, we have the highest number of Uyghurs everywhere in the world except China in Turkey. We have more Kurds in northern Iraqi Kurdistan. Why? Because of our imperial past. People like in Vienna, when you look at who are the uh, second minority, Germans naturally, then Balkan origin people, yes, Austria-Hungarian Empire, this is the legacy, and Turks because of our contacts. So inclusivity is a test. Those powers who accept, who learns this historical lesson will rise, will at least sustain the crisis. But those who deny this, like President Trump saying America first and in America uh, WASP first, it is so for American identity especially, it will be a big test. During President Obama time, when we went to uh, uh, White House, it was much more, much more multicultural, multi I mean, uh, black, white, Latino, all of them were, but now I didn't go to White House during President Trump time, but I don't imagine whether in the corridors you can find any other, or black or Mexican, or Muslim man. This is, this is imp important for us in Europe, in the world. Inclusivity in regional sense also. Regional, regional orders are collapsing. For example, one of the best example success story was GCC. Even GCC is collapsing now because of this exclusivist approach inside GCC. Same EU uh, is facing a crisis. Catalan issue or Scottish referenda or uh, Kurdish referenda in Iraq, these in different regions because of this capacity of inclusivity. Either nation states will manage this and establish regional orders, then I can give you a good example of regional inclusivity. During Iraqi war in Istanbul, we established Iraqi neighboring platform. This in 2003, just before the war, American friends were angry because they were ready to attack. Suddenly we organized a regional uh, forum, which continued six years. And there, first time ever in, his, uh, in Middle East, to Iran and Saudi Arabia, Iran and Egypt, all the neighboring countries were around the table just to agree on territorial integrity of Iraq. For example, now, unfortunately, on Syria, we don't have such a platform to protect Syrian territorial integrity. There are so many examples. If you ask questions, I can, we can discuss more. Inclusivity in global sense. Today, we are not 19th century Eurocentric colonial structures. We are not in the 20th century when there were two poles, also five winners of Second World War. We are in a global age. We have to accept the reality that in this age, international structure, global structure must be much more representative and inclusive. Like UN Security Council, on what basis now just five countries can decide for everything almost, and the other 187 country can just uh, vote in UN General Assembly, which doesn't have any decisive power? On what basis? Second World War was last century war. It is over. There is a new, more inclusive structure. When we were chairman, I was prime minister of uh, Turkey, we hosted uh, G20. I instructed my team that the main theme of G20 will be G20 LDC countries relation. And LDC forum was met in Turkey. LDC, Turkey was LDC coordinating country. LDC is least developed countries, 47 or 48 country. We tried to make a, an economic forum of the most developed and the least developed countries together. Then you can have an international global order. Same for cultural order. Uh, 
Uh, do I have some more time? Maybe five minutes, ten minutes? Okay, I will try. To I, it was a shocking experience for me as a European. For Turks, you may not hear from Turks as a European. No, we are Europeans. Whether some people accept or not, Turkey is part of Europe and will continue so forever. Our history is with Europe and European history uh, cannot be written without Turkish archives and archives in Vienna as well. Uh, in 1990, I went to Malaysia as a teacher, a professor, uh, and without preparation, they asked me to teach history of political thought. Okay, I said, I took my book, went to the room, and prepared a curriculum. But when I saw the students, I was shocked. Because it was like a small United Nations. There were Chinese, Malays, Indians, uh, Afghani people, Africans, at least 20, 25 different Bosniaks, different students. But my book is a universal standard, George Sobine's history of uh, political theory book. Starts with Greeks, continue with Romans, then Christianity, middle centuries, middle ages, then uh, uh, Renaissance, reform, uh, modern ideologies, Marxism, Hegel, Marx, etc. finish. There is, there is no single Chinese name in the book. <coughs> when China was at least two, three thousand years before Greeks, there was Chinese imperial tradition, not city-state. There was no single Indian name, although Indo-European nations came <laughs> from to Europe, <laughs> and that Indian Aryan culture was there for centuries. And there was no single Muslim name. If you don't know that Aver Royce means Ibn Rushd, Avicenna means Ibn Sina in one page, on, in one sentence. And there is no African, no Mandela or Nkrumah, not, not, not modern. And of course, Latin America is, this is, this Eurocentric approach is over. We have to accept the fact that there is a new era. There is a new need for a new global culture. But we are such sometimes so Eurocentric as if this is the history. Then I prepared a new course outline, starting with Confucius Analects, uh, uh, Rig Veda, Veda's text from India, then uh, Greek, then Romans, and some Persian, uh, then Muslim political thought, then uh, modernity, and in modern centuries as well, Gandhi, Mandela, etc. Try to make it more global. Why I am with this example? A global order can be achieved only if that global inclusive character is there. Otherwise, even if we say in Vienna, in Istanbul, in London, in New York, we are humanitarian. We are humanistic. Without embracing all humanity, you cannot be humanistic. It was, this is first principle. There are many other examples to give. Second is internal consistency. Internal consistency. And this is a relation between values and mechanisms. If you, have, if you respect certain values, you have to respect for everybody. Uh, let me give you one example, which is very, really disturbing. Uh, 49 innocent people were killed in New Zealand. I am grateful. When Charlie, Charlie Hebdo issue, uh, the terrorist activity in Paris happened as a Muslim prime minister, I went to Paris with all the other leaders. Although Charlie Hebdo, there was an insult against our prophet, for us, nobody has the right to punish anyone because personal punishment. And I was there to show solidarity with French people, with European people, with all the others, for, with intellectuals. But who went to New Zealand to show solidarity with Muslims? 
And when this terrorist activity happened in uh, Paris, many European leaders used the terminology Islamic terrorism, Islamic extremism. For last 20 years, we always was trying to say, don't say, don't bring religious name with terrorism. They are terrorists, okay, but don't give an impression that terrorism is identified with one religion. But after New Zealand incident, we didn't want, never, I ne we never used Christian terror, white terror, but it is interesting, Trump's message, there was no single name of Muslim. He says he shows solidarity with New Zealand people, New Zealand community, New Zealand, as if New Zealand as a country needs solidarity. New Zealand is a strong country. But where is solidarity with Muslims, ordinary Muslims' feelings? This is just an example of internal, if you want to have order, if you are a state, then all citizens are equal to each other. If you are a union, like European Union, all uh, states and communities are equal to each other. In globe, all humanities are equal to each other. There are several other examples could be given for internal consistency, but we have to be consistent. Uh, in you might surprise in Islamic tradition, political tradition, there is a principle. It says almost all scholars of Muslim thought in the past says the religion of a state is justice. A state without belief can survive. A state without justice cannot. This is a principle in our traditional political approach. Justice is the religion of the state. Not Christianity, not Islam, not Jewish, not all, not this. Justice. And justice could be, should be implemented without any discrimination. These are the idealistic principles of my proposal uh, in the sense of uh, in, uh, uh, inclusivity and internal consistency. The reality, they are realistic proposals. The two additional uh, pr principles is interest optimization and power implementation of power. These are five I's I call. Inclusivity, internal consistency, interest optimization, implementation of power structure, and institutionalization. I implementation, uh, interest optimization. Today, what we need is a rational negotiation. Rational negotiation uh, creates a common logic, a common approach. But unfortunately today, what we're observing is the emotional politics is rising rather than rational politics. When the counterparts are sitting against each other or together in a forum, everybody comes with his or her, her own approach, uh, subjective approach, rather than a rational uh, uh, negotiation. In rational negotiation, you have three options, either win-win or win-lose or lose-lose. If in international relations, you have many win-win cases. It means there is an optimum optimization of interests, and this confidence to system is positive. Everybody will believe, so everybody is winning. Why EU is a success story? Because in 1990s, until global economic crisis. In European Union, everybody wins, nobody loss, loses. But after the global economic crisis, some start to lose and that created a problem. In today, win-win case is very rare. Almost there is no win-win case. Win-lose case, which means in one, one side loses, the other one wins, is increasing. If one side feels always loser, that they are losers, then they lost confidence to the system. <coughs> Today, Palestinians, for example, they feel that they are always loser. 
How do you expect from a Palestinian to, re to have confidence to UN or to international system? Because so many promises were given from 1948 until now, lastly Oslo process, none of them has been fulfilled. There are millions of Palestinians everywhere without any identity. Refugees. That creates a sense of frustration. Lose lose case is win lose case is dominant. Lose lose case is increasing. Like in Syrian crisis, is there any winner in Syrian crisis? Everybody lost. Some people may think Bashar that regime win won the war. No. What happened to a country? Is Assad forces controlled? No. In some regions, Iranian militias are controlling Shiite militias. In some regions, Russians are con establishing order. In some region, opposition. Nobody won. So we have to have a new era, both in three national, regional, and global sense, interest optimization. Fourth is implementation of power structure. You may have ideal things in your mind, but you need a power to implement it. And power should have an ethical substance in it. To get power is a political uh, objective for politicians. But power should be seen as an instrument. And how power is legitimized in international relations. For example, uh, first Gulf War, when Saddam has invaded uh, Kuwait, there was a UN Security Council resolution collectively take all the measures, resolution says, collectively take all the measures to end this occupation. So that power was legitimized by an international organization. Therefore, all the countries had the same objective there. But in the second Gulf War, when George W. Bush, son President Bush, came invaded to uh, Iraq, they even misused the document, I mean, the evidences, and they went there without UN Security Council resolution. So power, even if they want to achieve something, important is how are you legitimizing your power? And last principle is institutionalization. Institutionalization is needed to realize these principles of inclusivity and uh, internal consistency in a realistic manner of rational optimization, uh, optimization of interest and power structure. And today, unfortunately, national institutions and regional institutions and global institutions are facing crisis. There is a need of restorations of institution as the aftershock of earthquake. For example, in the biggest, I don't mean national institutions like collapse of Syrian national institution, no. Assume that American politics, President White House and American establishment, President Trump and American establishment. There's a huge experience of institutional accumulation of experience in American uh, system, in foreign ministry, in Pentagon, in everywhere. But one tweet in the morning by President Trump can change everything. One tweet. And tweet is so easy to write, but the consequences are so widespread. Why? Because of this populism, rising populism. They not referring to institutions. Weberian institutional rationality is not there anymore. And several in several other countries, this becomes a model now in many European right-wing extremism or in Latin America, you can see this, uh, I don't want to say collapse, but irrelevancy of institutions. There is a need of restoration of institutional logic and rationale. Regional institutions, as I said, GCC or uh, others are uh, declining, but more important, global institutions. This is the last. 
uh, I want to say. Throughout century, in modern era, after every big war, there was an institutional renewal in modern era. I don't want to go back to history to Romans, don't worry. Uh, but 30 years war, there was a Westphalian agreement to establish the rules and principles of the new order. After Napoleonic Wars, there was Congress of Vienna in 1815, here in Vienna, which established the new rules of the game, which led to balance of power. After First World War, League of Nations. Because of the failure of League of Nations, we had Second World War, and after Second World War, we had a UN system. Britain was system in economics, UN system in political sense. And Cold War was a global war as well, which continued th three, four decades. Everywhere in the world, a bipolar Cold War. Cold War does not mean absence of war. There was a war, ideological war sometimes, hot wars in different, in Vietnam or Korea, and after the Cold War, there was a need of a new restructuring, renewal of institutional structure of global order. In 1991, there was a need of a consens consensual new international law and order. But nothing has been done from that time until today, as if there was no Cold War, as if there was not ending Cold War, in UN system, nothing has been achieved as a reform. UN Security Council has the same structure, all the other, but there is a new global uh, globalization in global order, but the order itself is archaic modern, not global, not only even modern. And now it is creating its own challenge. Global economic crisis came out, there was a need of a new financial structure, financial architecture. Architecture is a good term for institutionalization, but almost the only real change was uh, the change of G20 as an annual format. But the other uh, gaps in, in economic order continued. The gap between the most developed and the least developed is deepening every day. Even between companies, there is a change. Uh, so what we need today is a new reformulation of our values of humanity. New mechanisms to realize these values. And the most important two values, if we want to have order, national, regional, or global, inclusivity and internal consistency. The way of doing politics should be based on rational negotiation, and power should be used referring to values, and values should be supported by power, and necessary institutions should be renewed. This is basically what I call the future I mean, of, for uh, pro projection based on uh, realistic optimism. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah. But I cannot, the same level, I will not be able to see everyone. Yeah. So as a, as a, like as a uh, <laughs> professor, I want to see all the. <laughs> uh, but we more, can sit if you want, no, no, no problem. For me. But I'm when I sit, I didn't see, for absolutely. example, the faces of ladies behind. Yeah. yeah. Even more, I'm going also to invent uh, some changes in the order. Uh, and the idea is the following. I'm going to ask you one question, but then I'll go to the colleagues, because I really want to make it much more inclusive. Yes. And then you're going to have <laughs> the last word, and here the privilege is that you can decide not to answer some questions. Uh, uh, but I'm going to ask you because I do believe it was one of the most consistent presentation I have been think, uh, hearing recently because you're right that people are much more kind of excited about criticizing the status quo than to coming with the alternative. The problem of the inclusivity is and basically having consistency is not easy because in a certain way we are constructed in the way to see the hypocrisy of others when it comes to values than to our own. You made a very important point about the reaction. 
of all of us concerning what happened in New Zealand. And I'm on your side. On the other side, I do believe we have also a very kind of a, in my view, dangerous trend to try to use this also for domestic political reasons. To be absolutely honest, I also saw the campaign of President Erdogan recently using the footage of the killing for campaigning for local elections. This is dangerous. This is going to be as dangerous as if somebody is going to use the same type of a footage during the Paris terrorist attacks. Because this is changing the idea of who we are as a state, as a humanity. How to go beyond this is my first question. And the second is, I was recently in Turkey with the colleagues talking to a lot of people, and I heard a phrase that made a very strong impression on me. Uh, there was somebody who you also know very well who said, do you know, Ivan, the World War II is over, but World War I is not over yet. Mm -hmm. And I have been thinking about this, not in a provocative term. There is something about this. In a certain way, if you look at uh, what is happening, particularly in Europe today, you're going to see kind of a four different, three different logics of what happened in, for example, Habsburg's former imperial space that went to reintegration with the European Union. You see basically what happened in the Russian federations, what happened in Turkey, and we see also the crisis of the post-imperial states in the Middle East which was also, I'm very much interested how this idea of the inclusiveness is going to be very much combined with this strife for national identity, for nation states, and how this is going to work in the world which is much more interdependent than ever before. These relations between domestic politics and foreign politics in the world in which it is easier to protect the physical borders than the information borders. Before going to the colleagues also, I have one joke to make listening to you, which was great. We knew that probably the Russians selected President Trump, but we know that you basically suggested President Obama. <laughs> 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 so, so please, I do believe that we can pick up people who have a question, so even basically go into the discussion with Professor Dvetogu, and then we're going back to you in order to basically okay, summarize. Okay. Yeah, Nilsh. Many thanks for your very interesting talk. Um, I would like to ask a question. Looking at the whole picture, I found it very interesting that you made a strong point about the ethical fundament of politics of government. Um, I'm a law professor here at Vienna University, and there were, I would like to ask you about uh, the role of the law. And um, my, my impression would be that maybe the legal fundament of government constitutional uh, regime, uh, the rule of law is maybe even more important than ethical uh, fundament or values because in the case of collision, it's maybe the rights are basically m more easy, more important to protect um, by that. But this is just an impression. I, I'm wondering where the role of the law is in the whole picture and the mm -hmm. role of constitutional mm -hmm. uh, ideas. Many mm -hmm. thanks. Milos is also permanent fellow at the Institute. Uh, and I'm going to ask everybody else basically to represent himself, please, when you're asking your question. Thank you very much. I would also like to, uh, Excellency, to revert to inclusivity, as you mentioned, from Roman Empire onwards. Uh, what about having more inclusivity for the Kurdish minority within Turkey and outside uh, to, to change maybe from a win-lose, a lose-lose situation to a win-win situation? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, please. We are asking our, ourselves sometimes whether Turkey is presently closer to Russia or to the United States. What is your answer to this question? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And yeah, please. Thank you. I'm Tamás Futi, Hungarian journalist. Sir, you avoided two topics, the prospect of the Turkish-European Union connections and also the role of Turkey and or the prospects in the future in uh, um, the Middle East between Israel and Turkey. And the second question, if I may, I requested an interview with you and I got an answer that you don't give any interviews. Can I ask you why? What? I, I re <coughs> requested an interview with you. And I received an answer that you don't give interviews. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. 
Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. Listen, Interview, we, yeah. we basically covered the whole world. <laughs> uh, uh, so, but this is a great, uh, this uh, I do believe a, a great Thank opportunity. You. And I want to go back to you because really some of the questions that we are talking is critically important. Inclusivity on the level of the international order is very much related to the inclusivity within our own states. And this is true for everybody. In a certain way, every or many states, they have a, their different Kurdish problem in the way it's going to be defined. I also do believe that the problem of the rule of law is important because I was recently in Moscow and there was an interesting story where Russians said, we're supporting international law, but we are not going to support a rule-based system because the rules-based system means exceptions. I'm very much interested how basically you're going to read also this coming from, uh, uh, from this story. And then the role of Turkey, if you go to the United States today, people are going to say, we talk about allies, this and that, but basically Turkey now is a NATO member only in name. Uh, to what extent we see also a major geopolitical reorientation of Turkey, which could be right or wrong, but this is a question that in my view is also great to be answered. So of course. you Thank have you. the word. First. <laughs> There is a somebody who is in charge of the final order, and this is Anna. She's going to give us a sign because we promised that 7.30 we are going to solve all the problems of the world. <laughs> <laughs> first, about your uh, first questions. Pain is uh, pain, and for all human beings. Pain should not be subject of a political uh, issue or objective. And if we share pains, yesterday I was in Mauthausen concentration camp, and uh, that was a pain. It was uh, important to know uh, there were 18, uh, 80, 80 Turkish people who were in concentration camp, concentration camp. Some were Jewish origin Turkish citizens, some were Turkish, I mean Muslim Turkish citizens. But at the end of the day, they had the same destiny. And 20%, I asked there, 15 to 20% of the, uh, those people in concentration camp, they were Jewish origin. The rest were from Balkans, Serbs, Albanian, Bosniaks. Even there were Spanish who escaped from Franco, came to France, and then uh, Germans invaded and took them to uh, Mauthausen concentration camp. Now, of course, we, uh, when we look at the history, it's m many people may think that this is just Jewish pain. No, it is a pain of all humanity. Whether Jewish or Muslim, Christian or atheist, humanity, human being is human being. We have to agree that this is the principle for us. Then it will be easy to solve issue. But if we declare terrorists by religious names, then you will uh, create a polarization of pains. Uh, pain I observe when I was minister and uh, prime minister. Uh, in every Ramadan, in holidays, uh, the breakfast I was doing first day with refugees in camp. When you stay refugees in camp one night, you can see all the pain. And they are, some are Muslim, some are Christian, some are Sunni, Alawas, Kurdish, all these. But it is the fact. So we have to show solidarity with everybody, regardless of their ethnic or religious background, and we have to respect pain. Uh, about the First World War didn't end. Yes, it's, it's true. We Austrians and Turks, we understand each other in that sense. Because if there are two countries who are in 100 years, real loser of the war was Austria-Hungarian state and Ottomans. Because the, uh, the Austria became a much smaller nation state and Turkey became bigger than Austria, but much less than Ottoman territories. And all the Ottoman legacy became a Turkish era, area of responsibility. Uh, what should be the role of Turkey in that sense? It was surprising for some people, and 
my our foreign policy sometimes was declared pan-Ottomanist, which is which is not true. For some people, it was surprising in 2009 when I became Minister of Foreign Affairs. There was a Butmir process by U.S. and EU in Bosnia, which was not successful. I visited Belgrade uh, as Minister of Foreign Affairs of Turkey, then Sarajevo, and we established Turkey, Serbia, Bosnia, Herzegovina trilateral process. Turkish people had a negative attitude towards Serbia because of uh, 1990s, and Serbs usually had certain prejudices against Turks because of historical reasons. But history is history. Today we have a reality that Serbia and Bosnia-Herzegovina must work together. They will have to live together in Belgrade or Sarajevo. I am really grateful to President Tadic in those days, Minister Vukeremic, myself, Minister Alkalai, our President, Prime Minister. We established a new mentality in Balkans that Turks and Serbs, hand in hand, work together for a peace in Bosnia-Herzegovina. This same in, in the Middle East, there was a question on uh, Turkish-Israel relation, just to make a reference to it. I was the mediator between Israel and Syria in 2007 and 8, 8 and 9, 7 and 8, until Israel bombarded Gaza. It was the most successful peace negotiation between Israel and Syria, and we were very close to a peace settlement. Very close, only a few words were missing. We didn't say we have a problem with Israel because of Palestine. Our position on Palestine is clear. Palestinian people, like other nations, deserve to have their own state, and East Jerusalem is, should be the capital city of Palestine. This is not only our position as a Muslim, or a, but Christian position is the same. Christian Palestinians. This is not a religious issue. This is the position of UN on 242 resolution, etc. in many. So we have to ha be objective and try to... The First World War didn't end, really. And the Syrian-Turkish issue now is because of the border. Uh, and that border was not signed, was not specified by the people of Middle East. It is Psychospico agreement, one French, one British. Who, but the price is being paid even today between, uh, by the pe people of the region and autocratic regimes are trying to oppress people in order to consolidate their power, not to consolidate nation state. So there is a need of a new inclusive approach in that sense. Uh, in the regions of First World, First World War as, uh, as well. I fully agree uh, if I am misunderstood about uh, rule of law and ethical formation, and it is difficult to separate these two. Uh, rule of law could be established only if there is an uh, agreed philosophy of law together on certain basis. Uh, and ethics, morality, and legality, I don't say legality, legitimacy, uh, not just legality, is, originates from these common norms and values. Uh, I fully agree that rule of law is the basic. But for rule of law to continue, there should be a shared set of values, norms of the society. In uh, Turkey, in several other countries, we are facing this, uh, uh, how to deal. Sometimes it is legal. There are many issues I can give you from our politics or, or in other. It seems legal, but it is not legitimate. Le legality does not mean always legitimacy. Formal legality is something sometimes conflicting with the ethical legitimacy. In my book, I am saying it on this basis of legitimacy, which will be, uh, the, will be appearing, uh, what, what is the highest level of legitimacy of a political system? <coughs> Throughout the human history, human beings uh, looked for two objectives, basically. 
two things they want to achieve, security and freedom. Security is important for existential continuity, survival. Freedom is important for human dignity. Freedom is a human issue, not uh, basically we are human beings because of our desire for freedom and free will. In our region, for example, in the Middle East or in other parts, regimes are telling to the people, I can provide you security, but don't ask from me freedom because it will risk security. If a political system says to the people, I can provide you security, but not freedom, this is autocracy. Not only in Middle East, in Europe as well today, many, count, many political trends. They are saying Muslims are threat. Africans are threat. I can protect you. But if you protect in that way, you are limiting freedom. If a <coughs> political system or leader says to the people, I can provide you freedom, but not security, that is chaos. Today, national state structures are uh, trapped between autocracy and chaosocracy. <laughs> there is no racy <laughs> but chaos. What is the legitimacy here? Rule of law is there to provide this. If a political system says to the citizens, I will provide you the highest possible security without limiting your freedom, or I will provide you highest possible freedom without risking your security, this is the ultimate uh, objective, uh, ultimate level of legitimacy. And rule of law is an instrument for this. At the end of the day, law is for us. We are not for the law. Law is realization of our will. In the, uh, today, in uh, several uh, places, this is the fact. Coming next question was on Kurdish issue in Turkey. Exactly here, what it lies. We can, we, we, we should defend freedom without risking security. And in Turkey, uh, therefore I <coughs> mentioned in my speech, ethnicity or multicultural ethnicity is a fact of life because of historic background. Uh, and people, once, just to how things are going, just to give an example, I went to Afghanistan in 2009. First time ever a Western or NATO member minister, I went to North Afghanistan to Mazar-i Sharif, Balh. And I went to Shibirgan, Jevizjan, close, they were under Taliban threat. And governor of Mezar-i Sharif, uh, Balh, <coughs> Balh province in Mezar-i Sharif city, when we came in, we sit, the press was there. He said, Mr. Minister, welcome, most welcome. But we need roads and hospitals in Mezar-i Sharif. We need schools in Shibirgan. And I invited my ambassador, I, I instructed him to take all the notes, <coughs> what they need. And I told them in one year, all these things will be reconstructed. Hospitals, schools, roads, etc. One journalist later told me, governor of Mezar Balh is asking from you as if he's governor of Konya. Konya is my hometown in Turkey. So openly, direct, as if I am, he's my constituency in election. I said, yes, you are right. Because Mevlana Jalaluddin Rumi of Konya is from Balh. Why I am giving this example? The same expectation is in Balkans. Why? Because the ethnic origin continues in Turkey. And Kurds in that sense is not a group different than these other groups. Therefore, we, we assume that all of them are equal citizens. A Bosniak who came from Bosnia or Kosovo, and Kurds and Turks, they are all together as equal citizens of Turkey. That's how we approached. 
When we came to power in 2002, there were many limitations on Kurdish pop people in Turkey. Singing in Kurdish song was prohibited. Speaking in Kurdish was prohibited, etc., etc. There was a series of democratization processes. In my last election campaign, I myself, I greeted the people in rally in Kurdish, just to show that Kurdish is the language of this soil, of this country. I was cri heavily criticized by nationalist circles. When I addressed them in Kurdish, they uh, welcomed me, thousands of, tens of thousands of people. They called me Serok Vezir Davutoğlu in Kurdish. Prime Minister Davutoğlu, welcome. And some nationalistic circles criticized me. I am a Turkey, I'm in Turkish origin, Sunni. They said, as if I am uh, supporting separatist Kurdish demands. I said, if in other countries people address me, Prime Minister Davutoğlu, you are, why you are not disturbed? When our citizens addressing me in their mother tongue in Kurdish, this is natural as well as for me, it is a respect to me. If I am if they don't address me as a Turkish prime minister in their language, why, uh, how can I uh, work for them? Or if I undermine Kurdish language? This is the fact that we have to be inclusive for all. Not only in Turkey, but outside Turkey even for uh, Kurds in Iraq. When they were massacred in Halepçe, which was anniversary was a few days ago, they came to Turkey. They didn't go other places. For Turkey, insecurity sense is safe haven. But what is the limit of this freedom? Public order. No organization can have the right to destroy public order. With my Kurdish citizens, they love me. Even today, when I go to Kurdish uh, populated areas, they welcome me as, as if I am still prime minister. They respect me. But when these PKK groups, despite of our efforts for solution in 2013, they promised to leave arms, to leave Turkey first in months and to leave arms in one year latest, but they didn't do so. Then they digged the streets, the cities, the roads, they put blockades, barriers, and divided the cities as if it is Syria. Almost for one year, we patiently followed just to convince them to act according to their promises. But when children going to school were not able to go to school, hospitals were invaded. Streets and uh, there were rule of law. Rule of law is the character of national order. They established some courts, illegal courts, to punish those who are acting against terrorist organization. Then in 2015 July, as prime minister, I ordered, uh, ordered uh, when they killed two policemen, when policemen were sleeping, to fight against terror. So that freedom security balance should be established. No national government can allow a group of terrorists to invade streets, to prevent schools, to establish parallel courts, etc. But we had a long way to come. Uh, today, the future of Turkey, I fully agree, should be inclusive. Not only Kurds, Alevite groups. We made some reforms we had to make. All citizens of Turkey are equal to each other. Uh, this is basically where we are on Kurdish issue. About Russia, US, and NATO, let me answer this question together. When in my strategic depth, I said it was a reinterpretation of Turkish geopolitical uh, scene and geopolitical structure. There I established certain I, principles I suggested. At that time, I was a pure academician. I didn't have any plan to be minister or prime minister. And one was, which I mentioned, security, freedom, balance. 
in Turkey and outside. Second was best relation, if possible, zero problem with neighbors, to restore relations with neighbors. Third was uh, effective regional politics in Balkans, Caucasia, Central Asia, Middle East. Fourth was multidimensional foreign policy regarding big powers and also regional powers. And what does it mean? Recently I mentioned in one meeting, Turkey is like a bird which has four wings. If these four wings are attached to each other in a coordinated manner, that bird can fly much faster, much safer. Uh, one is our traditional transatlantic link, one wing, NATO, US. Another wing is EU. Long way and there was so many discrimination against Turkey. Unfortunately, in 2004, it was a missed opportunity, despite of all the promises by European leaders to us, Cyprus negotiation ended. Uh, with Turkish side saying yes for peace, Greek, side, Greek Cypriot side saying no. From that time until now, although there was a psychological absence of trust to this process, still Turkey is in Europe, will continue to be in Europe, and Turkish-EU relations are important. That was another question I will answer to this. Third thing is Russia and Asian powers including China, Russia, because Russia is our historic uh, neighbor. We had wars in the past, peace, wars, but at the end of the day, Russia and Turkey has common interest in stability of Balkans, in uh, Caucasia, in Central Asia. If, if Russia and Turkey are together, it is a stabilizing force. Turkey, Turkey, Serbia, Bosnia trilateral process was an asset when, and Russians realized that we are not for polarization or for tension, uh, deepening tension. Same in Georgia crisis. Georgia is our natural ally. But in 2008 war, Turkey, our Prime Minister Erdogan and myself, we all went to Moscow and Tbilisi to ease the tension because we don't want, Turkey is an economic power and the economic power always want to have stability around. We never provocated any tension, even for Iran, for example, the fourth thing, regional powers. Why did we work so hard for Tahran agreement in 2010? At that time, the question was, is Turkey pro-Iran or pro-US? Every year, people are asking this question to us. Are you pro-EU, pro-Russia, pro-US, pro-Russia, pro-US, pro-Iran? Why we need to have pro-pro? We are full in a multi-dimensional world. We have to have good relations with everybody. In 2010, you remember very well, May, after long negotiations, we achieved one of the most successful result in nuclear uh, issue of the Iran with Brazil and Turkey, based on the letter of President Obama. I was the negotiator and mediator uh, at the uh, last stage. Brazilian colleague Celso Amerim came. We went to Tehran. We achieved, I don't want to give all the details, but all the low LEU, low enriched uranium, would be, have been given to Turkey by Iran. And oh, uh, uh, IACA would, IAEA would be given to Iran fuel. It was. And at that time, Iran didn't have middle enriched uranium. But we have been protested. We, it, ha, it was not been appreciated. And they think that is Turkey uh, uh, way away uh, is spreading from transatlantic orientation to pro-Iranian camp. It was a peace initiative. And Turkey and Brazil together, why they were not happy with this? Because first time ever, two non 
permanent member of UN Security Council was able to find a solution for an international crisis. This question should not be asked to Turkey. I mean, you can ask any question, but nobody has the right to question Turkish intention, whether Turkey's uh, good relation with Russia is an alternative to US or EU or Iran. This multidimensional foreign policy is a must for Turkey. And Turkey should act in this direction. I am not now in executive power, but this was, uh, and this is today, I think, Turkish position. Turkish EU relation uh, uh, it is a subject of another long session, but let me say, just repeating, uh, EU cannot be a strategic player without Turkey in economic and geopolitical sense. And Turkey cannot have full integrated foreign policy and economic development without EU. We need each other. And if that two needs match together, there will be a new strategic vision for EU and for Turkey. We are not competitors. We are not enemies. We are not other parties or uh, we are not in Cold War Turkey is on the other side than Europe. No. But what should we be doing? First, a sense of common destiny. There is no European destiny without Turkey. There is no Turkish destiny without Europe. If we agree this psychology, then the rest will come. In 2016, when I was prime minister, we negotiated on uh, migration issue. It was a burning issue for all of us. Turkey was suffering because of existence of 3 million Syrian refugees. Europe was suffering. And for three, four months we negotiated. At the end of the day, we achieved a deal. With good intention, with uh, Angela Merkel, with uh, President Tusk, uh, Juncker, all of us, we were, and at that time, Werner Feynman was prime minister of Austria. Today I met him. Day and night we negotiated. At the end, we found a solution. And with our common effort, we were able to control refugee flow. But, and it was not just refugee flow, it was a set of agreement to revitalize Turkish EU relations, uh, having uh, 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 twice. EU summit with Turkey, uh, revising uh, common, uh, custom union, opening new chapters, visa liberalization is the most important. And what happened after I resigned, as if the agreement was made with me, the, the rest of the commitments were not fulfilled. The refugee flow was controlled, but the rest, nothing continued. And 2017 was the year of election in Europe. Elections are good in democracy, but very bad in foreign policy. Uh, I, as Turkey Minister of Foreign Affairs, I observe this. It is good for democracy, but it is not good for foreign policy and economy. Because in every election, in order to get the people's support, you, have, you are becoming more and more emotional, addressing them. and. Turkey became, 2017, you had four critical elections in Austria, Netherlands, France, and Germany, and Turkey had one referendum after coup d'etat attempt, of course, that referendum was critical. And suddenly, in European election, Turkey became the main agenda, negative agenda, in election campaign, and Europe became the main negative agenda in Turkish referendum campaign. Now it is over, 2018. It, there was a m better, more rational relations. Now it is time to recover. At the end of the day, we need it, each other. Neither Turks will go back to Central Asia like Eastern question assumed. We will be here. We will be in Vienna. We will be in Berlin, in London, because this is the global era. Nor EU, we can exclude EU from, a, a EU is in ourselves. From Congress of Vienna in 1815, 
Turkish system is always European-based system. Based on that, I hope there will be a new revitalization of uh, Turkish-EU relations. Thank you very much.